Hello, hello everyone, and welcome to a ClimateWise Communities Workshop. Um, so before we get started, I'd like to um, I'd like to say on behalf of Council that I recognise the traditional custodians of the land, past and present, on whose land we stand. Karingai Council is proud of its Aboriginal heritage and the culture, and we especially recognise this in my welcome to you. So I would like to firstly introduce um, the panelists to tonight's uh, ClimateWise Communities workshop and bushfire simulation. We have with us Dr. Jenny Scott from Kringai Council. Um, Jenny is a sustainability project leader. Mark Schuster, who should be joining us shortly, is a bush is Council's bushfire technical officer. And uh, with us we have Captain Andrew Wilson from the Clara uh, Rural, Fire, uh, Rural Fire Brigade uh, with the RFS. And we have also have Asha, um, who is uh, who, who is also from the Kalara um, RFS Brigade. And uh, from New South Wales Fire and Rescue, we have James Manuel and uh, Kim Simpson. So, and myself, my name is uh, James Chan, and I am a Sustainability uh, Projects Officer with, with Council, and I help run the Climate Community Program with Dr. Jenny Scott. So, a little bit of housekeeping before we uh, dive in. Um, we have two key functions that you can use to interact with us during the workshop. We have uh, the Q&A um, uh, button, which you should see either at the top of your screen or at the bottom. If you have any questions, put those questions into the Q&A uh, box and we can uh, then address them as uh, at the end of the workshop. If you have any technical issues, uh, please put those into the chat box as well. And uh, one of us will, uh, will answer them um, in the background there. So, but please remember to put all your questions into the Q&A. If you put them into the chat, there's not work. So the aim of this workshop is to show you how a, a worst case bushfire scenario in the Karingai area and how you can prepare for that. The idea is that if you prepare for the worst case scenario, anything less will be a cakewalk and you will uh, get through it very easily, or at least with minimal loss and uh, minimal trauma. So um, before we get to uh, go far ahead, I'd like to perhaps launch a poll to get a little bit of information about um, where you are in, in terms of your bushfire preparedness. So the, the, so the uh, poll is very short, it won't take much time. And if you could just, uh, it's only 10 questions. And if you could answer these questions for me, uh, that would, I would be really appreciated, appreciate that. So hopefully the poll, now can everyone see the poll? It should be appearing on your screen now. I'll quickly run through the questions and help you run through it. So the first question is, do you live in a bushfire prone land or embryo zone? And uh, that should be fairly straightforward. Um, have you experienced bushfire? Yes or no? And have you had a, do you have a bushfire survival plan? And if, if you, and the question four, if you do not have one, um, think about what might be holding you back, um, holding you back from, from having one. Now, if you already have one, just tick NA, I have a plan. Now, if you do have a plan, where do you keep it? And if you tick no in uh, question three, just tick NA and skip to the next question. And if you do have a plan, how confident are you that it will work in a major bushfire? And, uh, and uh, if you, if you uh, don't have a plan, just tick uh, not confident, because you have to answer every single question in order to submit the poll. Is your, and, and, uh, is your plan to stay and defend or leave early? That should be fairly straightforward. And the question here is, uh, question eight is, have you modified your home to improve its resilience? Um, and if, you're not, if, if you haven't done anything, just tick nothing yet. And if, there's, if you've done something to improve the resilience of your home to bushfires or storms or other extreme weather, that's not listed there, just put those in, in the chat. And last, one of the last questions is, uh, how well do you know your neighborhood? 
And lastly, the very last one is what prompted to you to attend this workshop? I think, um, yeah. So we have about 50% uh, of people have answered the question. If, um, if there's, we might leave it for another couple of seconds, just to give everyone else a chance just to answer the, uh, answer the questions there. Okay, I think we might leave it now. I think that's, I think everyone who wants to answer the poll would have done that by now. So we'll just end it now. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much everyone for, 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 for doing that poll for us. That, that information is really helpful for, is very, very helpful. Okay, so tonight we will be um, using the SIM table to uh, demonstrate fire behavior and we'll be running Two progressions. Uh, progressions are uh, past fire events. We'll be showing one from California and one from uh, the 2019 20 fires, the Black Summer fires. Okay. So here you're looking at the SIM table. Um, now, SIM table was purchased from the United States back in, 2000, back in 2019. And um, now, Normally, if you would see this in a physical workshop, you would see a tray of crushed walnut shell with a projector that would shine an image on top of the crushed walnut shell. And you, and you would shape the walnut shell into the terrain and to create that 3D effect. So that when um, you shine a um, aerial image on top, you get, you, you get to see the, the, the valleys and the hills and, and the plateaus of the area that, you, that you're looking at. Uh, but because we're doing it online, you, you only get to see a 2D version of it. Now in the top left of the screen, we have a wind controller. Uh, it's a circle with, the, with an arrow and we can control the wind speed and direction. And then down below in the middle, we have uh, the play control, um, which plays and pauses the simulation. We have the speed controller it, it, that controls the speed of the simulation. And we have the date and time here. When we do the uh, bushfire simulation in Karinga, you'll get to see an area burnt there as well. Okay. So the first one, uh, the first, uh, so we'll, as I said, we're going to show you uh, a couple of uh, progressions. So first off is the campfire progression from California. And that uh, this fire destroyed the town of paradise. And then we'll do the Gospels Man fire. And then we'll follow uh, that with a scenario where we assume the Gospels Man fire was not put out uh, and that it jumped the containment lines and made its way towards the North shore. And uh, while we show you that simulation, we will also cut in between uh, at various points to discuss the Climatewise community's website. And that's a tool which you can use to help um, make a, a very uh, comprehensive bushfire survival plan. So um, now, as you can see in front of you, we um, will be running the campfire uh, bushfire. So the campfire occurred in November, last, uh, November uh, 2018. It was named after the place of origin in Camp Creek Road just outside the township of Polga in Butte County. And that, if the, the, the township of Polga over here is in the top uh, right of the purple uh, square, you can see on your screen. Now, it was one of the costliest fires in American history, both in terms of lives lost and insured losses. So the conditions leading up to this fire, um, leading up to and during the fire created a highly combustible fuel load in the mountain forests. With... Hey, sorry, James, people can't see the table. Oh my God, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, for the last few minutes. Well, sorry. Um, you could have told me a bit sooner. Yeah, I sent you a chat, but... <laughs> I wasn't looking at that chat. I was looking at the uh, sim table. See, I'm a bit of out of practice for this. Uh, it's, been, it's been about, um, I'd say, close to six months since we did the last one. So um, I don't know if you can see, but my face is quite red right now. A bit embarrassed. Anyway, um, here we go. Ah, oh, well, I'll, anyway, I'll edit this out from the recording. So my embarrassment, oh, good. so oh, my, good. my shame will be hidden forever. So anyway, like I said, um, you see the wind controller up here and the play controls down the bottom. There you go. Okay. So as I mentioned, the, the fire started near the township of Polga in the, in the, in the northwest in the top right corner of the purple circle. So in the, the condition that led to this fire, uh, was that there was heavy grass cover due to a wet spring, an, un an unusually dry autumn, decreased humidity due to several recent, recent wind events, 
uh, unusually dry fuels and hot, dry, gusty winds. And that came with a red flag warning day, something very similar to, uh, uh, to what happened during the Black Summer fires. And in America, they have a red flag warning day, whereas that equates to a catastrophic fire danger day. So the fuel loads in and around the township of Polgo were very high, as there was no record in, uh, there was, uh, it hasn't been a fire in that area for quite a period of time. So on, on Thursday, the November 8th, around 6.15, and it, uh, a, um, a problem was detected with a power line around Po Dam, not very far away from the township of Polgo, within the, so that within a few minutes, fire, calls started reporting a fire in the area. So I'll stop progression now. And as you can see, the fire has uh, pops up here in, in the corner near Polga. So fire tankers are dispatched to the fire were, un were unable to gain access due to the narrow winding mountain roads that fire trucks were un unable to navigate. Aircraft were, were grounded due to gust winds gusting at 85 kilometers per hour, which is above the acceptable limit for water bombing aircraft to fly. Aircraft were also, were, un were also unable to fly all the way until the afternoon. So it just goes to show that even in a country like America that has all the resources they can dream of, all the planes, weather will still get in the way and make it very difficult to fight a fire. So the community in, in, the, community in the township of Concao didn't receive any warning. Uh, before the fire hit the town around about 7 a.m. And sorry, as you can see down below the timeline, it's already quarter past seven. And Concow is this area here, just around that lake area there. So please keep an eye on there. That's where it starts happening pretty quickly. Um, a, caller, uh, a caller at 7.07 a.m. reported a fire was in Concow and there was a high winds and they described it as ripping. The wind was ripping through the area. At 7.23, um, the sheriff's office in the township of Polga began evacuations. And as you can see here, spot fires have started just north of the, of the lake there. So the winds were carrying embers a good distance ahead of the fire front. Calls from residents in Concow and Paradise continued to come in over the next hour at a rate of one per minute. They were told that there was no danger and that the fire was to the north of Concow and no evacuations were necessary and they, could, they would be contacted should there be any threat or danger. But as you can see here, the fires starting to pop around the lake area here, and it's already started to pop. Uh, embers have landed and, started, and have started. And take note of the exits in and out of that town. There's an exit, a route going to the north, and out, out to the southwest, out to the west directly, and then out to the south, directly south. By, by, by 8 a.m., as you can see, it's 8 a.m. now at the bottom of the screen there, the fire entered the eastern areas of the township of Paradise. Several minutes later, Butte County Sheriff's Department issued evacuation orders for the entire town. Wind speeds were now exceeding 80 kilometers an hour, allowing the fire to grow rapidly. Most of the residents of Concow and many from Paradise were, were unable to evacuate before the fire arrived. Due to the speed of the fire, firefighters, for the most part, never attempted to control the fire, but rather concentrated on just saving lives. Now, according to the Cal Fire Chief, uh, in uh, the Chief of Dispatch, they said pretty much the, the community of paradise is destroyed. It's that kind of devastation. So what I might do here actually is I'm increase the speed of the simulation just to catch up with the narration here. So as you can see here, the fires are, are broken out all around the, all along the eastern side of paradise. It's really moving very fast around the lake area of Concow. And then shortly you'll see embers popping up on the western side of paradise, uh, cutting off the exit, exit to the west. So in the first hours of the fire, we saw a cascade of failures in the emergency alert system, rooted in the, in the which is, this system was rooted in a patchwork type system. And it came with an opt-in uh, system, uh, um, 
it, it, the, the, the emergency system was an opt-in system, meaning that you had to deliberately sign up. And um, this, opt this kind of fairly patchy uh, setup was uh, compounded by the loss of 17 phone towers. These points of failures in a fast moving fire allowed no room for error by anyone on the ground. So as I mentioned earlier, you can see the spot fires are now started to fire on, around the exit point here to the uh, west of Paradise. And then we have spot fires popping up here directly in the middle of the town of Paradise, further making evacuation from the town extremely difficult. Thousands of 911 calls inundated the two emergency dispatchers on duty, and there's just, just two emergency dispatchers. The emergency alert suffered from human error as city officials failed to include four at-risk areas of the city in evacuation orders. Technical errors on the day meant the emergency alerts failed to reach 94% of residents. In the first four hours of the campfire, it caused 86 civilian fatalities, 12 civilian and firefighters injured. 18,804 structures were destroyed with 62,000 hectares burnt. The total damage bill was $16.5 billion, of which 4 billion was in the form of uninsured losses. So people who didn't have insurance lost everything there. So as you can see here, the, the, the fires are kind of burning towards each other. The fire is so big and ferocious, it's creating its own fire weather. It's behaving in a very erratic and unpredictable way. And the, pretty much the entire town of Paradise was destroyed. The campfire would be recorded as the deadliest and most destructive fire in California history. So as we watch the fire progress here, I'd just like to make a couple of comments about um, the current situation of the town of Paradise. Only 30% of the residents have, have, have stayed or returned to Paradise. The vast majority have left. Um, until recently, the Google map, Google Earth images of the town of Paradise featured the uh, burnt out areas of Paradise. If you zoom in close enough, you just see burnt out houses. But that imagery has been updated to include vacant lots because people just haven't built their houses back yet. Um, they're waiting for uh, the power company that caused the fire to pay them off uh, and help them either rebuild or build or get a home somewhere else. And um, while I'm talking about uh, um, the power company that was at the cause of this fire, the fault that actually started the fire was a simple hook. It's like little, these little kind of pigtail hooks that connect the power cables to the tower. Those, those hooks haven't been replaced since they were first installed. So it was due to uh, a lack of maintenance and cost cutting that caused this fire. In fact, the power company pg &E, um, I think started 15,000, 1,500 or 15,000 fires in California alone in I think just a couple of years. So that power company um, is you know, facing a very uncertain future if that's even if they still exist right now. So, so um, this fire itself was only put up by a rainstorm. And uh, so uh, that's, so it was quite a devastating fire. So what we'll do now is that we'll stop this simulation and we'll go on to um, replay the Gospers Mountain fire, which I'm sure everyone is fairly familiar with because it only happened back in 2019, 20. Bear with me while I set the screen up. Okay. Okay, so the um, the Gospers Mountain fire um, was, as everyone should know by now, is the largest fire in Australian history. It started in 2019 on the 26th of October and was only put up by extreme rainfall on around the 8th of February, 2020. The fire burnt in a, a total of 512,000 hectares and 90 homes were lost and countless animals and insects were killed. In fact, if you drive through the Bells Line Road area, you will see that the landscape has largely uh, failed to recover because the ground was sterilized. 
uh, and the trees were so badly burnt, even though there's still some vegetation there now. So the conditions leading up to the fire, it was the hottest and driest year on record, three years from January 2017 to, to December 2019, areas of New South Wales had the lowest rainfall on record. All of New South Wales was declared in drought. And the fuel, fuel moisture levels were, at its, at worst, were extremely low. And there was the highest F forest fire danger index of all previous fire seasons. Also records were being set for a number of days with very high danger uh, or very high or greater fire danger. There was also no evidence the fire was driven by high fuel loads or poor forest management. This is most likely the fact that the average fuel loads, that they had average fuel loads and that there was record breaking fuel dryness leading up to the intense, leading up to incredibly intense fires. So the dry fuel load was what really led to the intensity, intensity of the fires. There were even reports of crown fires in recently burnt areas in the Blue Mountains. So the fire was started on the 26th of, of, uh, of October from a, um, a storm, actually, a lightning strike that, uh, that, that was that in that storm itself had 19,000 lightning strikes on that one day. And one of those lightning strikes, a random one to the, um, to the east of the storm, uh, started the fire in the Gospers Mountain region, which you can see in front of you. At, uh, that, that, that lightning strike happened at 10.55 uh, a.m. And within two hours after, the, after that strike, uh, 65 hectares were burnt. So I need to play with the speed control here just to manage the progression here. So just bear with me. So when that fire started, there was also um, winds of up to 60 to 70 kilometers per hour. So just like the campfire, um, helicopters could not fly and insert the raft team, which is a rapid response team to try and put the fire out. The wind made it, made it also a very fast moving fire. And so by the next day on the 27th, um, up to uh, 520 hectares were burnt. Firefighting resources were also already stretched to uh, across New South Wales at this point in time due to fires all up and down the state and beyond. So as you can see here, the fire is moving quite quickly now. And what I might do is I might speed the fire up again just to uh, get to the uh, next key point in the fire. If anyone wants to jump in uh, with a comment about what about this fire, please um, feel free. So don't want to have too much uh, well, dead space. I'm guessing that's probably me. <laughs> so what I think is <laughs> the notable thing about this fire is that it burnt very in a very similar way uh, to the the Paradise Fire in terms of the type of area that it was burning to and some of the speeds it gets to further into the fire but it was in largely unpopulated areas so the losses look modest in comparison to the paradise fire but had this happened in a around an area like Karingai where there are population on the interface then the result could have been very different Thank you, Jenny. Um, so at this point, um, there was a bit of a red, the fire actually slows down. Um, in fact, they were on the 5th of, no, of November, there was a bit of a rainstorm and the fire itself was close to being put out. And uh, so everyone was getting a bit of a sigh of relief and in some respects the fire was, yeah, went to sleep a little bit. However, on the 7th of November, very, uh, there was a change in weather that caused the fire to rise up. And that led to a really big fire run where the fire traveled 12 kilometers in one day. So at this stage, with the weather change, nothing could stop the fire. And that's and here you can see that fire run now to the, to the um, east here, a very quick run. I believe that might, even, might have even been a catastrophic bush fire danger day. Actually, no, that, that happens on the 12th. 
So now we can now the time uh, the fire if we speed the fire up to the eleventh, um, we see another big fire run down to the um, southwest. The progress of the fire is really fast, and it's now creating its own weather. So this is where I think the fire uh, had another big fire run, where uh, uh, where the fire traveled twelve kilometers in just two and a half hours. So to give you a sense of scale, how big, how fast that is, uh, how big the fire is, and how far the fire went, I'll just just zoom out here. So at this point, the it's the uh, the on this day here, the twelfth of November, was a catastrophic fire danger day, and that was declared for the entire region. Um, a pyrocumulonimbus uh, was formed uh, over the area, with uh, RFS volunteers witnessing a lightning strike starting spot fires. So this is a, a pyrocumulonimbus is when the fire itself creates its own storm, and this storm created lightning strikes, which then started more spot fires around the area. The fire progresses to the north and south boundaries at the same time, and by the end of the day, the fire has would have burnt six, 56 thousand hectares and has a perimeter of 170 kilometers. There you go, that's just down there is that fire run I was talking about. Now on the 12th, uh, we're on the 13th now, but on the 12th was the same day where the Kunun Road fire broke out in South Taramara. So that should plant uh, this moment in time quite clearly for everyone who lives in the Karingai. So we'll speed things up again. Uh, the next key point is on the 18th of November. So I'll speed things up a bit and zoom out to give you guys another view of how big the fires travel now. So another, th the next thing we'll be talking about is how embers played a very uh, significant role in the, in the spread of the fire. Um, so these high winds caused embers to travel uh, a good distance ahead of the main fire front. And that led to um, more spot fires that affect really that effectively sped the fire up very 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 quickly. And you should see the embers start appearing. I thought saw one appear there, and there's one just down to the west there. A few more down further along, around the wind, uh, around the Wiseman's Ferry area in Hawkesbury. So moving along through to the uh, 26th of November. Um, the, the same, there was some storm activity in the area that led to the, um, that led to a, there was a micro, there was storm activity in the region, sorry. And this storm activity led to a microburst that, uh, that flattened trees and destroyed uh, cars in the Karingai area. But this very same storm led to um, a spot fire starting up in the Northeast here. Uh, just, just you can see there, just to the northeast of the fire. So these these fires were now were then called the Little L Complex, the Thompson's Creek, and Three Mile Fire. There were more spot fires uh, about to start in the southwest and east of the fire. So now we have fires happening all around the region, and uh, making everything a lot more severe and harder to control. And when these fires join up, it's, that's when the fire became the largest fire in Australian history and was then termed the mega fire. So um, around about the fourth now, the fire does tend to calm down a little bit. But then around about the 5th of um, November, uh, the, the fires join up around about now. And uh, at this point, this, it was called the mega blaze. So the next, next key point along the timeline is going to be the 13th of November. Uh, that's the day before a planned HR burn was, uh, was planned for the Mount Wilson area. Now I'm sure some people here would be familiar with what happened there. Um, it was a back burn that was planned to hopefully, there it is there, sorry. I jumped ahead a bit. So, this backbone was planned for the 14th, as I mentioned, and the weather conditions on the day were, were mild and with no, with no expected wind. However, by 2 p.m., the wind picked up from the southwesterly direction 
and by a 2.54, uh, spotovers started. And then within 30 minutes, uh, the fire crews were doing property protection. So the fire went from, um, they went from doing a, a, a backburn through to, uh, to doing property protection within say uh, a very short period of time. So I'll play it now, just watch how fast it happens there. So that was a very fast um, uh, sort of fire. And um, that really caught a lot of the crews uh, off guard, the speed in which that happened. So at this point, now the fire is, is about five times the size of Singapore and is most definitely the biggest fire in Australian history. Now, uh, at all, all during this point in time, fire crews were working very hard to stop the fire jumping Hawkesbury River. And I believe, uh, Andrew, uh, I believe you might have been involved in, uh, in, the, in these operations around the Hawkesbury, is that right? Yes, that's right. Uh, we had a number of crews uh, going up to that Wiseman's Ferry area and across the Hawkesbury River to Backburn, um, to back towards the fire for, for many, many weeks on end. Um, hundreds of, of uh, members from numerous brigades in the northern part of Sydney. And we're also heavily involved in that um, escape out of that backburn on the Bells line of road as well. So uh, again, we had two weekends up there, the weekend before Christmas and the one before that, um, dealing with the, uh, the um, uh, run out of that uh, particular operation there as well. So yes, a lot of the uh, members of the RFS who are around the northern Sydney area will be very familiar with uh, this fire from uh, November and December 2019. Mm. Yeah, must have, and uh, you guys must have been uh, quite exhausted by this point in time as well, because it was quite a long campaign, um, I understand. Uh, yes, that's right. In fact, as you um, mentioned, the, the, the fires started uh, in the season around about August up in the very northern part of New South Wales, in fact, in Queensland, and we just saw them um progressively moved south uh, over the months uh this was around november december and uh, we were continuing to keep busy right up until pretty much the end of january as the fires got further down below canberra and around um, mm. coomer and uh, areas there on the very south uh, far south coast of new south wales mm. and uh, yeah it was quite it's quite quite a shocking uh, fire and uh, and this is just one fire as well there's mm -hmm. uh, as, as you mentioned andrew um uh, i was only able to get this one fire in the, in the area, but I think uh, there was another major fire just down south of the Great Western Highway as well. So, and uh, I believe that they were expecting the fire to actually burn all the way to the coast as well. So that was lucky that didn't happen. So um, at this stage of the fire, um, it, it was, the authorities were expecting the fire to actually make its way to the Hornsbury and Hills district. And in fact, um, there was plans made, drawn up for evacuations of Hornsby and, and the hills. And um, fire experts that looked at the fire were estimated that fire could have covered the distance from Wiseman's Ferry to the urban. So this is very possible considering the speed and distance of earlier fire runs that you had seen before. So this, highlight, so this highlights the fact that the fire can move very quickly and could potentially lead to mass evacuations, which are unlikely to go very smoothly. With, um, and, that can, and that can be driven by embers traveling up to 20 kilometers ahead of the fire front to start new fires that would likely complicate matters. So even though um, the fire was contained at the Hawkesbury, it, it, the, the, um, it still ended up threatening the Lithgow area. And the fire itself was only put out by a uh, big rainstorm on the uh, 8th of, um, of, of, of February, 2020. And this is the very same rainstorm that put the fire out, filled uh, the Waigama Dam from 40% up to 90%, and also led to wide, widespread power outages around the Karingai area, where some areas were without uh, power for up to two weeks. So that's very important to bear in mind. Uh, that's some, that's a very few fires during the black summer fires were actually put out uh, were, um, were only put up by rainstorms and, and uh, did not self-extinguish. So I think um, that what we'll do next is to, uh, is, to, is to run a scenario in the Kuringai area and make, and make the assumption that the fire didn't actually uh, end on, uh, the, in February due to rainstorm. We'll just assume that uh, there wasn't a rainstorm and uh, that the fire ended up progressing towards the uh, the, the North Shore of Sydney. 
So what I'll do now, just bear with me while I get that set up. So if, so Jenny, if, you, if there's anything you'd like to mention uh, uh, say at this point in time. Hasn't come up the, yet, um, James, still. But what we've seen so far? Still working on it. Okay. Hasn't come up yet, still. Not yet, still, still working on it. Okay. Ah, there she goes. Must be my right. connection then. All good. There she goes. Oh, okay, all right, cool. So as I mentioned, so I'll just do a quick recap of where of what we've seen so far. So we've seen the campfire uh, in California, which shows you how uh, a fire could rage through a urban area. And uh, the California actually was, has very similar terrain to Karingai. It's uh, the town of Paradise, or Paradise was sitting on a plateau, and there was um, had a ridge, had, which is an area higher above the, uh, the valley that was full of uh, forests there. And uh, lot, their terrain is very similar to, to, to Karingai. And that shows you how, how, how a fire could reach the urban areas and lead to house to house ignition. Then we showed you the, the Gospers Mountain Fire, which was a real fire that happened just to the, just to the northwest. That's a fire that's quite recent in memory. And uh, we'll just assume that fire, for, for the sake of the, uh, of, of, of the workshop, we'll assume the fire continues on towards the North Shore. So, and... Um, you might also mention that uh, the Hawkesbury River is, is not really much of a fire break because if the conditions have been, correct, uh, been quite bad or uh, had the conditions allowed, embers could easily have jumped to Hawkesbury and started a fire on its way towards the North Shore. So in this scenario we're going to show you next, we can't be sure how the fire will behave. So the following simulation we're going to show you is just one of thousands that could possibly happen in the North Shore. And uh, so just don't expect the fire that you see here to be the one that will actually happen one day. So with that said, Mark, could you quickly talk about the local area, um, specifically about the local topography, fire history and, and uh, HR burns? Yeah, certainly, certainly, James. Uh, yeah, we're surrounded on three sides by very large national parks estate. In the west, we've got Lane Cove. In the north, Karingai Chase, of course. And, this area we're looking at is uh, Garrigal National Park. Lots of valleys, lots of ridges, and fire loves that, of course, because it creates its own wind effects. I've walked, we've got an interface in Karingo of just on 100 kilometres. I've walked a lot of it and looking at fuel loads, even though we've had, this is our third season of La Nina, our fuels are pretty well near maximum potential. And that's about all oh, 18 to 23 tonnes a hectare which will certainly carry a fire. And you've got to remember, even though we might have a hazard reduction burn within three to five years after the fire, it's ready to have, can carry a fire again. So very volatile in some respects. What you're looking at on the screen, a lot of our summer winds are from the Northwest. That's the predominant direction. So you get a, a fire in Karingai, might cross Motorville Road, then straight down this throat. I call it the Bushland Throat of Middle Harbour come straight south through there. And you can see all the interface areas along both Karingai and also the Davidson area, forest, uh, forest, uh, yeah, the French's forest area of Northern beaches. So uh, yeah, lots of potential for fire runs and certainly pretty high intensity fire runs. Often our bushfires have been about 15 to 20 years uh, apart and they're often moderate to high intensity. So always that potential for fire. And even though there hasn't been too much down in Middle Harbour in the last 50 years, in the 50 years before that, there's certainly evidence of pretty high fire activity looking at the burn scars. So there we go. I'll hand back over. Thanks. Oh, thank you very much, Mark. So um, before we lead, start the simulation, I'll just um, I'll describe what's gonna happen. Um, during the simulation, we'll be pausing at various points through the simulation to ask you what you th to think about what you might be doing at that point in time, and then we'll uh, flip over to the Climate Community's website. And this is a tool that will help you make decisions uh, uh, about how to respond at various times, at various stages in, in, in a fire. And it will be a tool that you can use to make a really 
high quality bushfire survival plan. We'll also ask the RFS and members of the Fire and Rescue to tell us about how their organizations uh, will respond to the fire. And then you will hear about what they will be doing before and during these events. So it's critical that you have a clear plan for what you will be doing in the event of a fire. And that during large scale events, there's no guarantee that help will, will, will arrive. And um, actually I might just throw this over to, um, to Andrew and uh, Kim to talk about um, what, what, you know, what could happen during large scale bushfire events. Sure. Um, typically, um, on an extreme or a catastrophic sort of fire danger day, um, the fires can be very fast moving, generally associated with very, very warm to hot days, uh, quite windy from the northwest. Um, but the, uh, the, the real risk is around uh, warnings to the public. Um, uh, risk is getting the warning, uh, the um, Public, public informed of what's happening uh, so that they're ready to respond with their bushfire plans. And uh, what what we could expect in this sort of situation is um, a lot of people looking to evacuate uh, or move down roads that may all become very busy at once. And uh, indeed, there may be no way out. Some of these fingers of built up area into the bush there could quite easily be cut off. So um, there's some of the challenges that we could expect on a, on a day like that. <clears throat> Yeah, as Andrew was saying, um, a, a lot of a lot of activity on the road. So all, all the local stations have, have identified near back areas with quite large clear areas. The helicopters can land. Um, anything like that that a large amount of people could shelter. When as soon as we get a blow up day or, or I say extreme fire danger, approximately twenty percent of our resources are moved to the urban interface, and. Um, if there's a fire, if a fire is like identified in an area, then we um, then we pour more resources in, into that area. A lot mainly for property protection and infrastructure protection, more so than than actually getting in and fighting the fire until it hits the urban interface. A lot of our appliances don't have the RFS capacity to um, go on the fire trails and and, and off off road capacity, so we um. Mostly, uh, most of our appliances stick to uh, property protection, houses, factories, any vital infrastructure, electrical, and, and things like those lines. But there is a there is a like a our standard operating procedure for blow up days is, involves a lot of movement of stations from the inner city where there's a, a lessened risk of bushfire to to a lot of the urban interface areas, especially as you say, if an area has been identified as, as a fire has already started there. Okay, great. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew and Kim. So, uh, so I think the what we so what we will be getting people to do, well, as they look at the scenario here, is to to plan for the worst case scenario. So, you need to prepare to be on your own and to assess assess your risk and plan what you will do. And as we mentioned the uh, a little bit before, we'll, uh, the scenario we're looking at is is that the fire, the Gosford Man fire hasn't been put out and that it's a Tuesday back in January, 2020. It's hot, it's dry. Uh, there was very low humidity, dry fuel and windy conditions leading to extreme fire danger rating. And, uh, and then there's, high, there, those exactly, there's very same high winds have brought embers uh, on them. And those embers are now starting, uh, a, have started a spot fire um, down around um, the Davidson area up to the uh, middle of your screen, uh, to the top of your screen. So a fire has started. Now that could, as mentioned, that was started because of an ember uh, landing um, uh, in that area. So what would the RFS and Fire and Rescue be doing uh, at this point? A fire has just started, it's been reported. Um, how would you guys be responding? Yeah, well, the RFS, I mean, typically on these sorts of days, so generally there'll be a, a forecast that it's, um, you know, extreme or catastrophic sort of fire conditions. And, uh, you know, as with fire rescues that are gearing up in advance, we, we do the same. All our members are obviously volunteers, but uh, on, on days like this, we do have crews organised on a standby basis. And in fact, we do have a number of uh, 
people who would um, typically be at the station in case something happens in the local area. But um, essentially, if we get a call out to uh, this, this sort of fire, given those conditions and, and given the sort of level of preparedness um, and the concern we would have about what may eventuate, you know, our key priority is going to be uh, uh, protection of life, making sure that uh, community is warned of what's happening, that the fire started in their area and to uh, start to put their bushfire plans into practice. Um, it's essentially around making sure that, uh, you know, we can um, warn people to, to, to do that and also to um, um, encourage them to move, move uh, away from those sort of areas that are likely to come under immediate threat. We don't, um, on those sorts of days and, those, and, and, and the conditions that we might expect, uh, we wouldn't be looking to go off into the bush and tackle it head on. Um, because you can see clearly, you know, how this can eventuate quite rapidly into a very dangerous sort of situation. Uh, if anything, we'd be sending trucks along to the, what we call that interface. So those streets where those uh, houses meet the bush. And uh, as I say, trying to warn people, move them out of the way if possible, or, or look at uh, protecting properties as, uh, as they come under impact. Yeah, and, and we're very similar. We have a, normally a very good relationship with RFS and are often guided by by then, but um, we, we're also mainly at that stage or at that early stage is just trying to get. We don't have the the um, the legal right to, to make people leave. It's the police who do that. We, we can advise them and tell them we, we think you should leave until it gets to a point where it's too late to leave, and then we um, we are protecting the place as long as much as we can. But the um, as I say, the, the, the overriding, the overriding factor is, is as uh, Andrew said, not, not so much to fight the fire head on, but just to try and get the evac started, get the, get the roads moving. Everybody's not trying to get out at the same time and just getting congested and blocking traffic. So keep it steady up if we can. And if it gets to a point where it's too late to um, to, to move it, then we um, put as many appliances as we can in and around houses and, in, and infrastructure. Thank you, Andrew and uh, Kim. So, um, as a uh, now on a day like today, the, it could be very windy. So, the so this wind will kick up embers off the ridges, and as we see, and uh, um, these embers could could land on the other side of this ridge. And uh, we see saw here, as uh, Andrew and Kim were talking, uh, the fire started burning uphill against the direction of the fire because the the terrain has a big influence on how on fire behavior. So it will burn much faster uphill than it will downhill. But then when the fire gets up to the top of a ridge, the wind can, can kick embers off the ridge and send the embers traveling a good deal um, ahead of the main fire front. And like we saw in the Gosses Mountain Fire and the Camp Fire, that can make uh, the fire a lot more fast, fast moving and make it a bit more unpredictable. So, we would like to ask uh, everyone attending this workshop now uh, to be thinking on a day like today, what would you be doing? Um, where would you be? And, and how would you, uh, what, what would you be your plan? Uh, how would you find out about a fire starting off? Uh, that would, like, uh, how would you find out about a fire in your area? And how would you monitor its progress? So, so what's your plan? Do you stay and defend or do you leave early? So at this point, we'll just pause the scenario and, and, and move it and uh, go to the ClimateWise community's website. So bear with, me while, bear with me while I start a new share. So the ClimateWise community is a website that we developed uh, to help the, res the members of the Karinga community to become a bit more prepared to extreme weather events. Our main threat is, as you know, uh, bushfire. So, the tool that's contained within this website is called the ReadyCheck tool. And to use this tool, you go to the ClimateWise Communities uh, website here, and then you scroll down to the bottom and you click on the green button, to start your ReadyCheck. You just click and agree to agree and proceed. And this is just a fairly standard disclaimer here. There's nothing much there to read. So, uh, the ready check is a five step process. And the first step is a mapping uh, a tool. This mapping tool will help you find out what extreme weather events 
uh, or, or what natural hazards you need to be aware of that might affect your property. So for example, we'll put in a uh, random location, 33 Vale Street, Gordon. Now this map will is color coded to, to illustrate the various natural hazards that affect a property. Now 33 Vale Street is this property here in black. And it's got a bit of blue on it, a bit of yellow, a bit of red. And it's, uh, and so that means this the property is affected by, uh, by, by flooding. Uh, it's on bushfire prone land and it is at risk from uh, bushfire flame contact and or radiant heat. The purple is illustrates, it indicates that the area is subject to ember attack. Now this property here isn't affected, doesn't have a, a blue hatched pattern over the top of it. If it did, it would indicate that there is exit issues, uh, meaning that should you try to evacuate, you could find yourself uh, facing a one way in, one way out uh, problem. Now, if you scroll down, uh, you, you'll see a summary of the different natural hazards that, that your property is, is exposed to. Uh, here you can see this property is, is, is exposed to bushfire, ember attack, has flood and has storm and heat wave. All the, all the properties in Karingai are subject to storm and heat wave. However, this particular property isn't, it isn't uh, um, affected by ex ex exit issues. Now, it's important to mention that uh, you can save this stage to this step to a PDF and that the website does not save any of your personal information. However, if you don't save to PDF, as you move through the steps and leave the website, all that work you've done will, will, will be lost. So we hi highly recommend that you save to PDF as you progress through the various steps. So quickly, we'll just um, move to the, your personal situation. So this step was developed with research from RMIT and the Bushfire CRC. Um, by, it was by research by the RMIT and Bushfire CRC into the Black Saturday fires. So these, the questions you'll see here uh, were of major significance to the effectiveness of bushfire plans during those fires. Now it is composed of a series of uh, tick boxes and hints as to why they are important to put this into your bushfire survival plan. For example, um, it will ask you questions like, do you live alone? And if you get a bit of red text down below, it will give you a hint that you might need to, need to consider this in your plan and if you need help or if you need help um, to help others. Or if you live with others, well then everyone in the household should know what the emergency plan is and how to implement it. We'll ask questions such as, you know, who's in the house? Children and elderly people have different needs. So those needs need to be factored into your bushfire survival plan and your trigger to leave. So we move on through here, it, it, it's fairly comprehensive, and but it doesn't take long to do. And you'll see it covers things like uh, health and medical condition, pets in the household. Pets are a very Im important one. People often forget about their pets when they make their bushfire survival plans. Pets need um, care and assistance uh, in evacuation centers. Some evacuation centers, centers won't take pets. Uh, if you do have a pet and you need to evacuate with them, they'll need food, a box or a crate and other supplies. And the website and this section goes through other parts here, which we won't go into too much detail, but you can you can go through this step in, at your leisure at home after the workshop. Again, once you've completed this step, uh, feel uh, make sure you save it to the PDF. So in conclusion, these these questions here should inform your trigger to leave. Now a trigger to leave is self-explanatory. It's basically at what point do you decide to leave? If you have children or if you're elderly or you have health issues, well then your trigger to leave could be a good deal earlier than uh, a, a couple with no children, for example. So um, I'd like to throw this at, out to the RFS and Fire and Rescue. If there's anything you'd like to comment about um, how personal circumstances can affect people's um, a trigger to leave. And, um, Yeah, I think, uh, as you've said, James, it's a matter of uh, everyone thinking uh, about their own circumstances, uh, where they live, who they live with, and uh, really factoring those sorts of um, 
features into the plan and being realistic about you know the plan they can make and uh, what they can rely on and um, and uh, what their response is going to be. Um, it's essential that uh, all members of the community think about these sort of things and and have the plan and use these sorts of tools that are available and. Um, I think uh, from that, the important thing is that um, uh, everyone's uh, gone through this process and given it some thought and realized that no two plans are going to be the same. Everyone will have different circumstances. Um, they'll be away at different times of the day and uh, different capabilities, and it's uh, being realistic about those. But the important thing is to have given it some thought uh, before the summer and to have uh, put it down in the plan. Thank you very much, um, and Andrew, for that. Uh, any other sort of uh, anything? Would anyone else like to add to that before we move on? Yeah, um, yeah. I think that a lot of it's got to be communicating the plans. You come up with an idea, you know, what you're going to do, if you're going to stay, whether you're going to go. A lot of it about it's going to be preparing your uh, property well before the fire day. You know, we often see people jumping up and cleaning um, their roof gutters out on the day of the catastrophic fire day. Well, try and get that done early on in the season, beginning of the season. So. Um, a lot of things we tell our members is, you know, when you're out cleaning the gutters for a fire, come looking at the weather coming up, you're actually cleaning the gutters out to stop the roof flooding on the roof leaking and stuff like that. So there's a lot of that property protection coming in now in the months leading up to these fire seasons. And then communicating the plan with extended members of your family and your neighbours and sort of stuff. Because generally, Mr Murphy likes to make an appearance on these days where the time of day you might not have the car or someone will have the car out so you can't get out when you want to get out and things like that so have other ideas or other plans and how you can help your neighbors or they can help you and that sort of stuff so have plan b c and d ready to go that's very very good points there uh james really really good points and we'll we'll touch on some of those um in the coming section of the of the uh, fire so anyway actually uh, we might uh, go back to the fire um and see how it's getting on so um, on a, typically on a day like today, uh, the fire, uh, the wind speed does tend to pick up. So in Karinga, I'm sure everyone's fairly familiar, on a really hot, dry day, um, we get most of our wind from the northwest and it can gust up to some pretty high speeds, say up to 90 kilometers per hour. And it's like, it's like being inside a, a fan force oven, okay? And uh, on days like that, and when the winds get up to that high, that, that speed, it really makes the fire behavior, it supercharges the fire behavior. So you're, as you can see there, you've, you've seen a, a big run of the fire uphill. That wind has really forced that fire up very quickly. And it also means the embers travel a good deal further ahead of the main fire front. So fire, embers can jump whole suburbs or whole areas here. And, um, and make it very difficult for uh, crews to respond to, um, to this. So now, would, they, would Mark, would you like to comment on what council is doing at this point in time and how council might be responding to this, 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 this situation? Yeah, sure, James. Uh, we have a, uh, a local emergency group uh, within council and that is coordinates with police, RFS, uh, uh, Fire and Rescue, of course, and other agencies, and they come up, there is a contingency plan already, but they will be in close coordination watching this very carefully. Uh, they'll communicate via the website, radio, all other means, ABC, ABC Radio particularly is the one to listen at at these times, and just look at pinch points or weak points, so to speak, for evacuation, uh, where police might need to be stationed to flow traffic far more easily from out on some of those ridges where it's one way in, one way out. So yeah, they'll be very proactive and watching very carefully what's happening and reacting quickly to those situations, both with fire and rescue and RFS and police. Police are a major factor in this for our dense traffic situation. Mm. So yeah, that's that. Actually, Mark, that's a very good point about the police. Um, in a situation like this, uh, it's quite likely the police might actually end up setting up um, set roadblocks to stop uh, re uh, people from entering an area and making a bad situation worse. That's this right, because you've got to that... realise that smoke is a major issue. Most people aren't used to heavy smoke also, mm. so that can confuse people particularly, and they may mm. need guidance. And... Well, yeah, yeah. so now you have smoke, you have high winds, 
You have uh, a lot of people trying to evacuate or uh, get out of the area, uh, leading to a general sense of panic perhaps, and people try and get back into the area because they might have children, they might have parents, they might have pets still in the house, in the area. Um, and uh, how, if you're a parent or if you're a carer for someone, how do you help your loved ones who are in, who are behind the roadblock and can't get out because you have the car, for example. So these are all things you might need, need to consider. So, um, so the message at this point in time, I'd imagine uh, Andrew and Kim and James would be that, um, is that if you were here, and you, uh, you'd have to, I guess, leave early. So that's, I guess that's the key message we're trying to share, uh, send to people in a, in a fire like this. It's really safest to not be there. And um, so in a, in a situation like this, is, would it be correct to say that water supply and electricity and communications could be compromised? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's um, quite likely that you can see where that uh, fire started to impact on buildings that would have uh, potentially knocked out um, some power lines, which would cut electricity to sections of streets there. and. Uh, perhaps even the wider area, if there was a, a fairly significant piece of infrastructure in the way of that fire. Um, water as well. Um, you can see how, how this fire's uh, now got quite large, but if you measure that um, um, length of that um, edge of that fire, you know, that started to grow quite significantly. There'd be a number of uh, fire trucks both fire and rescue and uh, the RFS uh, around all those streets where that fire is about to impact or has already impacted and uh, all of them trying to get into the water mains uh, uh, all at once is going to create a significant um, uh, drain on the water supply and you may well find if you go to turn on your um, garden hose or whatever that uh, there's very little that comes out of it so that's certainly a very realistic uh, situation. And um, actually, in a situation like this, um, I mean, I think would would RFS be having to make uh, tr tricky decisions about um, what properties to uh, or fire and rescue that is as well? Uh, would be would they be having to make decisions on what properties to try and defend as well, uh, given the limited resources that are on hand in a situation like this? Um, you know, how does RFS and fire and rescue make decisions on what properties to um, to try and protect? Well, yeah, unfortunately, the reality is uh, there cannot be a fire truck, you know, at every single house. And um, and uh, even if there are lots of fire trucks around, it's it's not going to be possible to save every single house. Uh, that's just the reality of the situation we face. Um, well, the, the fire brigades do go uh, through a process of, of uh, triage, if you like, to see which properties are well protected in terms of their preparation and uh, other natural sort of uh, um, barriers against the fire. But uh, there may well be other properties which aren't uh, well prepared or are made of uh, certain sort of materials, which uh, mean that they're very high risk. Uh, and, and the reality is it may not be possible to save them. And obviously, there's going to be a, a prioritization of the ones that uh, are more savable than the ones that aren't. So I think the message there is, um, you know, being aware of, of that and also making sure that uh, good property protection, um, uh, you know, is, is one of the features of your plan to uh, tidy up the yard, cut back the overhanging vegetation and, uh, um, you know, using the, the good sort of uh, bushfire resistant uh, materials uh, where you can. Yeah. It's very rare that we pre-call, uh, we can't save that house sort of thing. It's often a thing that just happens at the time on the ground. The crews will say, we've, we've just come to this place, the house is well alive. Uh, there's nobody inside, but the, but the fire's through the roof. So we, we'd be looking to protect the properties either side of it and stop further ember attack, really. Um, but we, we really, because, because we're in a large build up area, we'll often have a, a lot of resources initially. So we, we don't have that um, bad luck that a lot of people in the country would face it. As, as, um, as Andrew was saying, that, that the fire engine is not going to turn up. So we'll just have to write this place off because A, we can't protect it, and B, we don't have the water. And that was a big consideration. I was in one of the bushfire seasons, I was in, it wasn't they couldn't put the fire out, they could get there, but they just didn't have the water. 
because of the, the severe drought in a lot of the country areas. So it was almost a, well, do we try and put this old shed out or do we save the water we've got for the stock or it's a um, different world really. But in, in an area, most of Sydney, you, you'll get a, a, a large response because we've got so many appliances that can be redeployed from, from inner city areas and areas that, that aren't under threat. And uh, mostly we, we can get a pretty good handle on saving houses in, in these sort of build-up environment areas. Right. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, I think now it would be a good point to go back to the uh, ClimateWise community's website and discuss property, because that's a very good segue into the next step of the ClimateWise community's website. So step three is all about property. So this step looks at what makes a house resilient or vulnerable to fire or things that can make it actually worse. At this step, uh, it's we, we ask people to draw a mud map of their property. Now, a simple mud map is uh, this exercise, it gets you to draw a very simple outline of your house and draw other features of, uh, uh, that represent um, features of the house that could make it either vulnerable to bushfire or weak to bushfire. So for example, in this, in this mud map here, you see the outline of the house. You have conifers down the side. Conifers are basically giant torches that can burn at high temperatures and, and, and lead to um, house loss. Decks are another good one. Uh, your pool could be a strength actually. And um, you can have uh, identify paving around some areas. That paving around a house is very good. Uh, it, it reduces the, amount, the chances of there being a fire. And, you know, anyway, you go through this exercise and you draw a simple map about, and then highlighting the strengths and weaknesses of the house. You can do that actually after doing the following steps. So this, um, so this, uh, this section, as I mentioned, uh, gets you to think about the parts of your house that could be um, vulnerable or, or weak to fire. And you can do um, you can you can just set, you can do an assessment of your house in terms of bushfire, flood, and heatwave. But for the purpose of this workshop, we'll just be focusing on the uh, bushfire. We have a legend here, which is color coded. So red is for serious weakness, uh, orange is moderate, blue is fairly resilient, and green is strongly resilient. Now we uh, it covers all sections of the house, leading aside from the roof. Uh, now, roof design is a very important factor in how resilient your house might be to bushfire. If you have many reentrant corners where leaves and embers can collect, uh, and you might have a complex roof shape with gables and valleys, well, that can be a bit of an issue for you. Whereas if you have a, a very simple roof design with few reentrant corners, there's not, much, not, much, uh, not many places where embers or leaf litter can accumulate. And, and have a bit of a fire that can uh, cause a house to burn down. Uh, it comes with roof material, such as old, old tiles, broken mortar, or you could have a, a new roof or a roof that's made of metal. So you just take whatever relates to your property. It covers off on, on, on roof sprinklers, roof lights, um, skylights, ventilators. Now, a common issue is that people have these uh, plastic uh, skylights now these things are really not very good during a storm or bushfire, and um, if you have a if you're experiencing a bushfire, embers can or a branch could break a skylight, and that could let let embers into your house and start a fire there. So we recommend people uh, replace out their old plastic skylights with either tough uh, with tough and safety glass that's sealed with non-combustible linings and has a corrosion resistant uh, bronze or steel mesh. Um, also, I recommend people uh, replace their whirly gigs uh, as well, if you can. Anyway, so there's quite a few features here. I won't go through all those. Um, the main thing people can do here is think about ember attack. Ember attack is the leading cause of house loss during bushfires. And a lot of the a lot of these uh, things you can uh, a lot of the these these tick boxes here can relate to making a house a bit more ember proof here. So the this section covers walls. Uh, exposed timber with rotting and peeling paint is often a bit of a vulnerability. So, you know, think about how you can improve the condition of your house, make, make sure your house is very well, well maintained. Windows and, 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 and frames are a big issue. 
Um, if you have, uh, again, a timber frame with flaking paint um, on a window, well, that could be a big risk. So you might want to consider replacing those windows with uh, more bushfire resistant windows, such as uh, metal frame windows with, um, non with non combustible shutters and toughened glass. Doors are covered as well. Garage doors are also an issue. Uh, so quite often doors have, garage doors have big gaps that allow embers in, and then people might store flammable, flammable materials inside the garage as well. It covers off from floors. Um, you know, uh, a lot of houses in Karinga I have are, are, are elevated on a slope, allowing a big space underneath the house for, and that encourages people to store things underneath the house. And those things can be timber, it could be um, all kinds of things that could catch fire. So think about what you keep underneath the house and how you can enclose your house to make it ember proof or not store any materials under there that could catch fire and maybe sweep out leaf litter. This covers verandas and decking. The deckings, decks are another big one that can catch fire as well. This section covers uh, the outdoor areas, landscaping. And uh, actually, Mark, could you talk about landscaping? This is a good, point, good thing for you to talk about because uh, I believe you, has, you have expertise in landscaping and bushfire. A little bit. Uh, and no one really has total expertise with bushfire ember because each fire is different in its characteristics and intensity, all sorts of issues. Anyway, the main thing is to try and keep separation both horizontally across a garden leading, leading up to the house and vertically. So it's to try and break or fragment the fuel load, so to speak. So have things spaced, uh, plant spaced at different heights. Don't have everything at a uniform height because that will allow fire to travel quite easily. The other thing, a lot of Australian plants are fairly fire tolerant and they lap up fire. So, and there's a fair species list, particularly CFA in Victoria has a wonderful species list of what you could plant in your garden that might be still a native if you love natives, but uh, less flammable. So there's all those factors to consider when you're planning a garden or renovating a garden, so to speak, not just your house, retrofitting a house, but you can retrofit a garden. Mulch is a factor, not, not to have too much mulch, build up against walls, against your house wall. So there's all these issues and those uh, things they call barley huts, uh, very flammable. So try and avoid those or the structure that makes up barley huts. And of course, uh, wooden fences, they're a no-no. So all those sorts of issues, just think about them. Uh, so yeah, landscaping is quite interesting and complex with regards to bushfire. As I said, CFA has a wonderful landscape guide. It's on the web, web uh, Victoria. So if you look that up, we can provide that later. Thanks, James. Thanks, Mark. Um, so if you address all these sections here, all these questions on, the, uh, on this step three here, and uh, sort of use step three as a way of uh, prioritizing kind of the work you can do around the house to make it more bushfire resilient, you could you can give you can uh, um, make your house more resilient and give it a better chance of surviving a fire, and that's about creating um, making house uh, uh, creating some uh, I think it's called passive defense, so that uh, if the house is quite resilient to bushfire, it uh, you can it will allow you to to leave and uh, uh, during bushfire uh, to go somewhere safe, and let the fire let the house have a better chance of surviving. So that's all about passive defense. Um, it's also worthwhile to think about insurance as well. Um, now, you know, uh, if your house was to burn down, um, would you be would you have enough insurance that would allow you to build back to a um, a bowel rating? Now, Mark, uh, could I get you to comment again on on bowel rating uh, on on the bowel rating of properties and so yeah, sure. know what they mean. Sure. Uh, Bell uh, bushfire attack level is based on something they call fireline intensity, which is, you can see them in front, the bottom of your screen, James has brought up. There's Bell low, which is fairly low fireline intensity. That's kilowatts per square metre that hits you. Uh, for a firefighter, you don't want to be uh, in anything more than about two to 3,000 uh, kilowatts per square metre for about 30 seconds. It will hurt you enormously. So you can see bell low is pretty low, but you're getting up to bell 19, you don't want to be there. Or even bell 12.5, the big bells, really high intensity uh, kilowatts per square metre, a bell 29, which they consider a lot of houses should be built to in the interface. And bell 40, that's 
and then after that is flame zone, particularly resilient to, to bushfire attack levels. Now, you've got to remember a lot of our houses on the interface were built prior to uh, what they call Australian Standard 3959 for building in bushfire protection zones that came in in 79. A lot of our houses are before that. They'd be in the Bell Low classification, so not very resilient to bushfire. And later James will tell you about the need for retrofitting uh, many elements of your house to upgrade it. And that also comes in with insurance levels. And hopefully in the future, insurance companies may take heed of Bell, the Bell level of a, of a house and reduce premiums. So yeah, that's a big issue under, uh, they're looking at the moment in Australia. So that's, Bell's quite complex. So, uh, but very interesting too. Thanks. Oh, thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, just to top this section here, uh, I'd like to make a couple, um, you know, uh, it's, it's very important to think of uh, not just the house, because you can do a lot of work to make the house uh, more resilient to bushfire. And though uh, it's very important to make sure uh, we address the landscaping around the house. Um, and um, the reason why I say that, I was, I was at a conference uh, last week, uh, the Australian Bushfire Building Conference, and the, um, the CSIRO Bushfire Research, just, uh, uh, Justin Leonard, made a comment that um, the re uh, from research and you know, surveys of houses burnt down during the Black Sun bushfires, houses with a for sale sign at the front survived much more than houses without a for sale sign at the front. Um, now, it's a, it's a bit of a funny comment to make, but the truth behind that is that uh, people who are selling their houses make sure their landscaping is really neat and tidy and prim and proper. All the leaves are raked up, cut, the grass is cut, and everything's looking really nice. So if you want to have a little shortcut to thinking about how to manage your landscape to make it more fire resilient and give your house a better chance of surviving during bushfire, Imagine you're trying to sell it, and that's the kind of standard of landscaping you're trying to achieve. Um, of course, other, it gets more complicated than that, like making sure there's no mulch up close to houses, but um, that's a bit of a shortcut way of thinking about it. Okay, so um, we'll just go back to the, um, to the fire now and see how that's, that, that's getting on. And uh, forgive me if you hear any vacuuming in the background. I hope you can, uh, I'm coming across clearly. The cleaners have now arrived. Um, so on a day like today, it's quite often uh, a uh, southerly buster will come through. And so what that means is that the wind direction will come, will change around uh, and start blowing from the south towards the north. And um, perhaps I'd like to get uh, sort of Andrew or James and Kim to talk about what that does to fire behavior and what can be the consequences of a subtly change like that. So maybe- you yep, Sure, well, uh, Andrew? yeah, thanks, James. Um, as we've seen so far with the simulation, the winds come from the Northwest. So it's top left uh, down towards the bottom right of the screen. Um, that fire as it started has been pushed in that direction. Um, what's gonna happen as the wind changes typically late in the afternoon from the south. Um, it's gonna come from the bottom towards the top of the screen. It's gonna to start to change the direction of that fire. And essentially what's been the side, if you like, or the flank of the fire is gonna turn into pretty much the main front. Um, so it's, it's gonna change uh, quite dramatically uh, the risk of this fire. It's gonna change direction. And all of a sudden those uh, houses towards the top of the screen there yeah. in the David scenario are gonna come under immediate sort of threat. So the, one of the, the key things out of this is that, you know, as, uh, as firefighters, what we're looking at is not just what's happening right now, but what may happen later on, you know, in an hour's time, two, three, four hours time. And, and this sort of planning is, is what we're trying to uh, look at as well so that we can respond uh, as well as we can, as early as we can to what's likely to happen in the near future. Well, thank you, Andrew. Um, so yeah, so it just goes to show how unpredictable fires can be, and um, and um, you know, and in some some areas around here, you could have uh, HR burns. And uh, Mark, in conditions like this, uh, what what role do HR burns play in the intensity of a, of a fire? And uh, yeah, that's and really interesting. Actually, in moderate weather, uh, has a reduction burn within, or oh, say 
a year to four years after a, a, a hazard reduction burn will lessen the impact of risk at the interface of, uh, of houses catching fire, uh, you know, on the sort of leeward side of the hazard reduction burn after the burn. But given really high fire danger indexes, uh, say extreme to catastrophic, fuels don't really drive a fire, the weather drives a fire then, and anything will burn, truly, I can tell you that. So uh, the hazard reduction burn will have far less impact on your risk, so to speak, of a house catching fire. So, yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, hazard reduction burns do have a beneficial impact, but under certain weather conditions, but when the weather dictates everything, when it becomes extreme to catastrophic, that's when, uh, you know, they have less impact. So I think the public... Uh, relies too much on a hazard reduction burn, making them safe. We have to be really careful to sort of counter that message in some ways. So, yeah. But it depends on your vegetation time since fire. So many factors, you know, I've spent years trying to work this out. and It's, it's one of the hardest things you can try and work out, truly. So, thanks. Thank you for that, Mark. Okay, so we might just leave this scenario here. And, um, and again, apologies for the background noise. So as we can see, the fire, fires can be very fast moving. Embers can travel a good distance, starting fires around the uh, fire head of the main area and can be very unpredictable and, uh, you know, and leave a lot of people in very uh, sort of alarming situations. So we'll leave the fire here and go back to the Climate Wise Communities website and discuss the fourth step in the ReadyCheck tool. And don't forget, if you're doing the ReadyCheck, please save your work to PDF so that you have it on file. So this section is mostly concerned with um, how well you and your neighbors can plan for these events. If this section gives you ideas on how to work cooperatively, how to work cooperatively with neighbors to make sure that everyone is informed and prepares their home, their house and leaves early. So it's, if you just excuse me for one moment. And now it's been, now because uh, fire safety is a uh, large a, a individual issue as well as a, uh, a community issue because house-to-house um, -house ignition is a real issue, is a real problem during these kind of catastrophic fire events. We saw how the, there was house-to-house -house ignition in the uh, Paradise Fire we saw earlier on. There was uh, issues where in Lake Conjola in Black Summer Fires where there was a lot of house-to-house -house ignitions as well. So you could prepare a house and make sure that's well, well, well prepared, but if your neighbor isn't, isn't playing, isn't doing what they can to make sure their house is well prepared, well then that could become a problem should a fire um, threaten your area. So one of the, in this step four, we'd get people to think about um, their local area by doing, again, a, a very similar, uh, by doing a mud map. This is a, they can do this exercise by downloading a template from the website, following the instructions here on the webpage on, and uh, hide, draw your local area, identify the strengths and weaknesses of your area, where the threat could be coming from, uh, where your neighbors are, where the friends are, where the family is, and um, where, where your exit route is, and, um, and other assets around this suburb that can uh, help you in the event of a fire. It's very similar to the mud map on step three. So again, similar to the previous sections, it's a, it's a series of questions that get you to think about your neighborhood. Uh, for example, the first one is, do you know your neighbors, each side of you? Uh, will you be able to help them or will they be able to come to your assistance? Um, do you have your neighbor's contact details? Can you access the, your neighbor's not yard if you need to escape via another means? And um, if you just go through here, it's quite, it's quite, it's quite detailed, but it's definitely worth thinking about. Um, now, would anyone like to comment on um, on the issue of, of house to house ignition I mentioned earlier. Sorry, I maybe didn't hear me because I think we have a lot of background noise here. Anyway, so 
um, I think we're, we're kind of running out a little bit of time now. So I'll quickly skim through the rest of, of the section here, but I highly recommend everyone goes through this, uh, this section and uh, give a good deal of thought and, uh, and, and talk to your neighbors about how you can collaborate together and, and, uh, and respond to a bushfire should one happen in your area. Uh, for example, are there any uh, tools you can use should trees fall down in the area blocking ways out and other things? So, and um, yeah, as you can see, it's quite comprehensive. So uh, please take some time doing it. So down the bottom here, we have some additional links that could be useful. Um, we have uh, links to the uh, Red Cross Get Prepared app. We have um, information on the emergency alert over the telephone system. And, um, and then the next step is to go to the step five, which is information for your plan. Now, this is a very quick step. It simply takes you to the various places where you can get templates in uh, templates from the RFS, SES, uh, Red Cross, and Carers Australia. So if you've gone through step one all the way through to step five, you should have all the information you, you need to make a really good quality bushfire survival plan. So what we'll do now is go on to the final part of the website, which is the uh, what if wheel. Okay, so it looks like there's a bit of an issue here, the web page, uh, the spinning wheel doesn't seem to appear. Um, apologies for that. I had talked to our web developer to solve that problem, but it doesn't seem to have been fixed. Well, anyway, what should be here is a little chocolate wheel. Now uh, with a bunch of different scenarios. Um, these scenarios came out of the 2009 Black Summer. And these scenarios um, were things that, um, had upended people's bushfire survival plans. In, in what I mean by that is that if, uh, people who had a bushfire survival plan during Black Summer, um, their plans failed because these scenarios popped up and their plans did not account for them. Um, and so, you know, they didn't have a plan B, they didn't have a plan C, they didn't have a plan D. And so the idea behind this get ready of this uh, what if wheel is that um, if you make a bushfire survival plan and you spin this wheel, it will come up with a random scenario. And if your plan doesn't take that into account, well, then you can have a think about it and then come up with a way of dealing with that scenario. It's a really good way of getting you to think um, a bit more creatively, a little bit more outside the box and think about what could possibly happen that could really uh, make a bad situation a lot worse. Um, I will get this section of the website working again in the next couple of days. So apologies for that. Um, actually, um, I think now we can move on to some other discussion points we didn't quite cover in the body of the workshop. If I could just throw over to, um, to James and uh, Kim and Andrew about things like um, if, if they weren't able to leave in time during a bushfire um, and they had to shelter in place, what kind of things would people need to prepare for and need to expect if they had to do that? Yeah, well, I'll start with that one. Um, if it is too late to leave and it's not safe to leave, and certainly there's a lot of uh, evidence of um, people trying to make a last minute run for it and getting caught out in a, in a motor vehicle or those sorts of things, um, it is safer to shelter in place. One of the key things uh, that is a, a risk uh, to life is the radiant heat of a fire and um, sheltering in a structure is, is a far better option than trying to make a, a dash uh, to safety at the last minute. Um, when you're more at risk of getting caught uh, by a fire and also by that radiant heat. Um, if you're out in a structure and you are sheltering, you obviously uh, have a better chance if you're down at the end of the house that's away from the fire and um, wait there until the fire front's passed off, over. Um, that's not gonna take very long, typically 20, 30 minutes, you might find the major fire fronts uh, passed across and then uh, you'll have a better chance of um, being able to uh, move to a safer area after that. Um, and one of the other the things uh, we also remind the community of is um, the community safer places, and they're all listed on the council website. If, uh, if as a last resort, you're unable to shelter in place, uh, try and head for one of those uh, particular areas as well. That's a really good point, actually, Jay, uh, Andrew. Um, 
so what can people expect if they if they had to go to if they if if they if they didn't if they uh, were caught off guard and they couldn't uh, leave early and uh, stay a sheltering place was too dangerous and they had to go to a um, shelter uh, a neighborhood safer place what can people expect of that shelter of that neighborhood safer place and can maybe sort of illustrate what it is and what it's not. I mean, I think that's what it's not is probably more important than what it actually is because people, I think there's a bit of misunderstanding about what a neighborhood safer place actually is. Well, it's really just a place uh, uh, with some protection away from the fire. It's not going to be an evacuation center. There's not going to be any real facilities. They're typically just uh, buildings that are opened um, with some degree of protection. Um, some degree of clearance away from the bush, but uh, it's a very uh, limited, um, um, you know, set of resources available. In fact, I wouldn't expect too much at all. It really is just uh, a place to shelter uh, for a short period um, whilst the fire front passes through the particular suburb uh, or area that you're in. And uh, as I say, there's, there's, there's no real expectation of um, major facilities there or, or any sort of, uh, long-term evacuation type accommodation at all. Mm. And, and Mark, uh, I believe it could be also quite an uncomfortable place to be should the wind be blowing. For some neighbourhood safe places, it could be quite uncomfortable, I imagine, as well. Certainly, because embers are ember uh, in an ember storm, and it is like a storm. If you even you look at the Duffy fire in Canberra from 2003, the embers were so extensive, and you'd want to be pretty low down on the ground and have cover over you because ember attack is much fun, so, mm. yeah. Okay, so, so. The, key, to the key point is leave early and uh, keep, a, keep on top of the situation. And the way people can get information about the fires is by the uh, Fires Near Me app, uh, also by monitoring the radio and a TV. I think, the, I think the ABC is a great source of emergency information. Um, and uh, with that note about uh, the fire, if, uh, if the power, power is one of the first things to go out as long, along with water, that means you don't get any communication via the standard means. It could be your, tev your, your television doesn't work, the internet doesn't work, your phones won't work. So you have to think about how you get your information about the fire and that will allow you to make the right decision at the right time. So we always recommend people to um, have a portable radio with them uh, that battery, that's battery powered and tune into the Sydney uh, ABC, which is the 702. And um, if you don't have that, uh, your car should have a radio that works. So jump in the car and make sure 702 is on your uh, pre-programmed uh, frequencies on your car radio. Um, so before we uh, wrap up, we have a couple of extra things we want to talk about. Um, we have the um, Bushfire, uh, Bushfire Wise Rebate Program. Now, this is a... Um, um, a, a, a a, uh, retro, a, a program, a rebate program that Kringai Council has. To encourage residents in Kringai to uh, make their homes more bushfire resilient. Um, hold on, just to bear with me. Uh, I seem to have um, gone to the wrong page here. So um, Mark, can you just quickly talk, while I get this web, website going uh, up and running, could you quickly talk about Things people can do around the house, uh, uh, like the, what, what, how to, how to, uh, you know. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, particularly, some things, uh, gutters are a really big thing. Gutter guards, uh, and certainly there's a whole range uh, from suppliers of metal gutter guards of a certain uh, diameter that will prevent most embers getting through, and uh, they're pretty efficient. The other thing is shutters, bushfire shutters or double glazing, of course, for glass. Uh, actually, we had a demonstration of that, the Blue Mountains standard glass versus double glazing special bushfire protection glass, but certainly shutters and anything to keep embers out from your subfloor, uh, really big issues. So there's a few simple things you do, uh, and that cost can be less, just a few, you know, hundreds of dollars to maybe $2,000 can really up, your, up the grade of your house and to take it up to Bell Flame Zone could cost for a standard house probably up to sixty or seventy thousand dollars, but you can do so much for just a smaller amount of money, which James's bushfire rate can uh, rebate can help on. So I think he's got to back up now. So thank you, <laughs> thank you very much, Mark, for helping out there. 
So um, yeah, so the, as I mentioned, the the, uh, the uh, Kuringai Council has a bushfire wise rebate program. So this rebate program is offers residents um, up to twenty five percent of the cost of bushfire retrofits, uh, and it comes with an additional top up of fifty percent of any DA or CDC fees that might be required to get your replacement windows or replacement doors installed. Uh, the rebate doesn't apply for any properties uh, like new builds that might be uh, might have condition it might have conditions of consent that force them to do um, uh, uh, build the houses to a bowel rating. However, if you have an existing house and you just want to make it more resilient to push fire, we offer a rebate to help you out there. So the rebate is a maximum uh, works out to be a maximum of a thousand dollars, and to and also has that top up I mentioned is a maximum of five hundred dollars for the CDC. So it's twenty five percent to a maximum of 1,000 and 50% uh, for fees up to a maximum of 500. Uh, the process is fairly straightforward. You simply submit your pre-approval application there, um, uh, enter the information about what you wanna do. It will come to me, I'll give you a call and send you an email. We'll have a conversation about what it is that you plan on doing. I'll tell you about the kind of documents you need to, to supply. It's very straightforward. You supply me with a step three of the Climate Community's Ready Check tool along with your bushfire survival plan and any uh, quotations and specifications of the work you plan to do and photographs of your existing uh, house, the features that, are, that you want to um, have made more bushfire resilient. The idea behind this is that we want to work with you to make sure that whatever you do is rock solid and will actually help make your house more bushfire resilient. Um, so that's that for uh, uh, for, for now, I'd like to just quickly run one last poll. It's about making a bushfire survival plan. And um, and I'd like to, it's a very simple uh, poll. It'll be just two questions. I'll launch it now. So as a result of this work, workshop, will you plan to make a written bushfire survival plan next in the next month or so? And um, so you can say yes, you can or you might already have a fairly comprehensive bushfire plan or uh, you don't plan on making a bushfire survival uh, plan. Um, and the question two is, would you like to re receive any reminder emails about this? Would you like me to sort of send you a couple of emails with tips and hints on how to make a bushfire survival plan? Okay, cool. Okay, almost there, almost everyone's responded one way or another. Um, so I think I'll end it there. That was very quick. Thank you very much for everyone who responded. Okay, and very lastly, I'd like to um, turn over the proceedings, the last part of the workshop to Mark um, to talk about, um, um, you know, uh, about his personal experience with fire and, and what got him into, into, um, in, into this, uh, his, uh, this field of bushfire. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, actually, when I was younger, many decades ago, I was trained as a zoologist. And uh, one of my first interests was in how uh, fire itself, fire management, can affect our fauna and flora. So I, in 1977, I did a huge project, actually, on uh, lizards, believe it or not, in a place called Thopal, just north of Brisbane, uh, north of Gympie. And looking at certain species seem to like favour different fire regimes or, you know, time since fire. And, uh, yeah. Certain species are more fire tolerant than others and uh, others aren't. After that, I suppose I've always been interested in fire in an ecological context, context. But come the bushfires of 2009 down in uh, Victoria, uh, relatives were lost. And uh, I thought, wow, you know, there has to be another side to bushfires. So. I got really interested in the asset protection side, protecting people primarily, but also buildings. And then an even bigger challenge, I'd worked in councils a lot of my life, and they were re really interested in, as is Karingai, how do you best balance uh, asset protection or the people and property side with the ecological side? And that's been my challenge, I suppose, <laughs> now, and it is a real challenge for the last 10 to 15 years. So I've tried to pursue how do you put fire management in that sort of context to keep everyone happy and everything happy, your fauna, your flora, which have different needs amongst themselves, 
with people and your property. And as uh, many of us know, Karinga, I think it's the third most fire prone LGA in New South Wales. So it's a particular challenge to try and match our fires. That's hazard reduction. Uh, our APZs or with the width of your APZ around your house, the bushland interface with all these different needs. And I suppose I'm a bit of a helper. That's been my life trying to help people. So this is the biggest help and biggest challenge I've ever had. So yeah, it will never end, I'm sure, because every every fire is different as all of us know. So yeah, that's my personal experience. And I'll, I think I'll keep doing it till I drop. So thank you. <laughs> I'm a comedian, but, no, but pretty serious stuff. Fire is serious, you know, and uh, and we will have more fires. Don't worry. We've had, you know, third season of La Nina, but uh, times will change. Australia is very volatile and, you know, we'll probably have three years, three or four years of drought next. So who knows? And, yeah. You have there's, to fuel there. there's, there's a lot of fuel in the landscape. So there's a lot. There is a lot the of fuel. It's built right up after all that beautiful wet weather we've had and I wish where I used to live in central Queensland we'd had such wet weather but we didn't see it so yeah very lucky to see rain whenever we can too well, much thank you. thank you very much for that Mark um Thanks. it's getting running a bit late so we kind of might think about wrapping up uh, we might think about wrapping up the workshop so if there's any questions anyone has about what we presented uh earlier um please feel free to um pop them into the Q&A um, I think we might, I think we covered quite a lot of territory. So hopefully we've addressed most questions people might have about fire and how that might come um, about how to prepare and what they can do. If you, have, if you do have any other questions that come to you after the workshop, please pop them into an email uh, via the ClimateWise Community's website. There is a, uh, a ask an expert section or the contact form. Uh, any questions you, you put via, you send in via that uh, website, they will come to me and I'll be able to get back to you. So um, it doesn't seem like anyone has any questions. I think a stunned silence maybe. Um, um, so it is quite late. So um, I'll just say thank you very much to, to um, James Manuel and Andrew Wilson, Kim Simpson, um, Mark Schuster and Jenny Scott for coming along to the workshop and helping us out there. And uh, apologize for, apologies for the background noise. Um, I'm here by myself, so I wasn't able to run out and tell the cleaner to stop vacuuming. So, anyway, so. You did well, James. <laughs> well, unexpected events do pop up. As did everyone. Well. Yeah, well, thank you very much, everyone, for coming along. And, um, well, we'll see you again at the next workshop. But for now, everyone, I'll um, say farewell. So, oh, there is a question. Sorry. Um, we have a question. Is that, I, um, I think that's it, really. They've all been answered. So anyway, we'll end the workshop now. So all right, thank you. And I'll see you later. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. All the best, Thanks, James. Hi, Jenny, you still there? <laughs> Are you muted? I see there's Christine and Helen still here and Kim still here. So you obviously- it, Yep. Yeah. Okay, so it's just us now. <laughs> you obviously worked out, I figured that I completed the download of the Zoom on the computer. Yeah. Whilst I was listening to you on the phone. So should work okay from here on in. Yeah. Yeah, that was a bit of a, uh, okay, that was, that was a, a little bit bumpy. <laughs> yeah, well, right, like you said, you're juggling a lot of uh, balls in the air at the one time. Yeah, yeah, and then you have a cleaner charging into the office, you know, frantically trying to vacuum everything or get the bins out, like, you know, yeah, so. You need to put a sign on the door, cleaner, do not enter. <laughs> Well, funny enough, the um, the previous cleaners I kind of knew on a fairly well, fairly uh, on a fairly well, I knew fairly well. Yeah. And if I was in, I'd wave to them, and they'll know not to vacuum. Yeah. But they've changed the cleaners, and um, wow. and uh, just 
caught me off guard there. But have to educate the new guy. Yeah, yeah. But uh, well, it was a noise. Was the background noise bad? No, it wasn't bad at all. Okay. Well, it was really bad here. Yeah. I'm using the I'm using the new microphone. Right. Yeah. You, can, you can hear it, but it was quite your your voice was well and truly over. Over. It. Okay. Cool. Mm -hmm. Ah uh, well, um, yeah. I, I I try. I did. I got. Uh, I went. I reviewed a previous work. A previous workshop. Um, uh, in um, probably East Kalara. Yeah. So I was trying to get the the flow that you use. Um, try and get that down pat, but that was still a bit of a challenge. Yeah. Well, if all you had to worry about was telling the story, you'd probably be all right. Yeah, if someone yeah. helping you that like you help me, I think you'd trump it all over. Yeah, I can't, I can't, I can't get, I can't, I can't expect uh, Mark to jump in there. No. I don't think, I don't, I don't think he wants to. Even if I was asked, I think he would just <laughs> run away. No, I don't think he's a technical person in, in terms of computers. Oh, he's good with ArcGIS, the mapping side of things, because that's his bread and butter for yeah. his work. But yeah. I think uh, outside that, he's, uh, he's. He's not keen on technology. Mm. But um, anyway, right. so hopefully next time, you know, this will work and I'll be feeling a bit more energetic and it will all uh, go back to normal. Yeah, well, you, you do have your fitness goals you have to achieve. That's so, right. So that, that'll help. Oh, Anusha has joined, by the way. Uh, he wants to do three chin ups. Three chin ups. Oh, three chin ups because he's got a bung elbow. Oh, okay. Yeah, so three would be a lot. Bung. Huh? Hope it doesn't make it more bung. Yeah, <laughs> that could be an issue. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, um, on the good side of things, because I uh, I uh, had to review a previous workshop and took notes from what you said, because mm. I can't, I wasn't rely on my memory to to do everything. So like I think because some of the feedback from Sam from last time I ran it by myself was that uh, I wasn't giving enough airtime to. The RFS to, to say mm -hmm. things. So I, I went back and uh, reviewed literally, literally almost type, not almost verbatim, but made some pretty accurate notes on what you said and how you um, did it. So it's a bit more practice, and I think, you know, I'll get it down oh, pat. Andrew got to say a fair bit tonight. Yeah, well, at least that's a tick. I managed to involve um, others other than just have me uh, <laughs> talking constantly. Um, because yeah, yeah so it's, uh, I had it. I had it all. I had it all in uh, in bold. I don't know if you can see. You can't see it there. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, practice, practice, all right. practice. So, are you able to pick me up on Monday? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. In the afternoon, I've got the exercise class at four o'clock at Warunga. Um, I don't. I don't know if you can drop me back to that point, but if you can't, I'll ring my brother and ask him to come in. Um. Yeah, hold on. What time is that? Four. I have to be there by four. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, but after four, I won't be able to help you out because I'll be uh, picking Kalin up from the daycare. Yeah. So, so maybe if you can arrange someone to pick you up after your exercise session. Yes, yes. I, I. That's fine. It was just getting from council to the exercise session. Okay. Cool. Yeah, yeah. So what I can. What time I can on you. Monday morning do you reckon? I mean, you don't have to make it at Sparrow's Fart. Oh no! I don't know. I'll I'll factor this into my hours. I'll consider this work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't want to actually be there the whole day. You know, I'm really supposed to be doing half days at the moment. So, um, um, after say ten. After ten. Um. Okay. Well, yeah. I could just work from home. And then drop bit, by on your way. By because there's no point in me going every which way up no. and down. It's just a giant triangle, really. That's right. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to be like going up there and <laughs> down, down again, back again, back again. I just, I'd rather make you know a bit of a a loop or whatever, like okay. a triangle. All right. <laughs> well, I will see you on Monday. Yeah, see you Monday. Um, enjoy your day off tomorrow for the public holiday. <laughs> well, more to the point, you enjoy yours. I've got to go. Teach vaulting kids. Yeah. Mm. Oh, wow. Okay. All righty. Well, cool. I'll talk to you on Monday. Oh, I'll catch you Monday. 
All right, then. See you. Bye. 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 I end this. Yeah.